We're going to talk about the big issue that's affecting you, affecting all of us tonight. We're going to talk culture war stuff. We're going to get involved in a primary tonight. All that and so much more coming up on I'm Right. You know what can be a challenge sometimes for you and me? Look, I'll, look, I'll make it about me. I don't want to make it about you. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But me, Matt, John, the team here, Michael, the team putting together this show every single night, trying to figure out exactly what we want to talk about. Because there's always something new, isn't there? There's always, look, hey, there's always a new terrorist attack somewhere. There are the Israel-Palestine things blowing up. The border's bad. And there's, you know, we do talk about all these things from time to time. But what of the big issues do we tackle? What should we tackle? What's right? What's wrong? It's not what people want to hear. What do we, what's the right thing to talk about? I've been frustrated over and over and over again recently with the Republican Party. I know you're going to find that shocking. But my frustration is only ramping up recently with the Republican Party. Here's why. They're seeming, they're seeming to be less and less and less in touch with normal people. And I'm not here to pretend like they ever were majorly in touch with normal people. But the more I pay attention to GOP politics at the national level, I'm just, I'm mortified at what they don't talk about versus what they do talk about. For instance, I want you to look up something. Here's a little, here's a little homework assignment for you. I'm not going to do it for you because this is going to be different for everybody. But here's a little homework assignment you can do, maybe on your phone while you're watching I'm Right right now. You have a congressman. If you have a GOP congressman where you're at right now, I want you to go browse their social media account, and I want you to see how often they have talked about anti-Semitism on college campuses. Go, go, go check on that. Check and see how much they've talked about that. Now, obviously, nobody's, well, I shouldn't say nobody, you shouldn't be pro-anti-Semitism anywhere, college campus or anywhere. But Go check on your congressman and see if they've talked about anti-Semitism on, you know, on Ivy League campuses. They will have said something about it, I guarantee it. Okay, fine, fine, no problem. Speaking out against anti-Semitism, probably a good thing at all times, right? Now, that same congressman, go browse their social media account and tell me if you've seen them address credit card debt. Go ahead. Give it a little look. Let me clue you into something. Two things. Two things. One is a fact. The other one is probably a fact. The fact is this. Americans are buried in credit card debt right now. Credit card balances since Biden's election are through the roof. But look, at that, look at that chart right there. Look at that chart. That's American citizens burying themselves in personal debt, high interest debt, to the point many will never get out, but the people who are buried that deeply in it, that kind of credit card debt will negatively affect the entire rest of your life. I've seen this a million times in my own life with people I know. It happens, on, and look, I'm not passing any judgment on anybody. You get yourself buried in debt like that, the rest of your life, your options are limited, your homes, your vacations, your, just everything, everything in your life is limited. You want to go out to eat, maybe some Red Lobster to celebrate Mother's Day. Ah, sorry, honey, visa bills maxed out. Sorry, got to make that next payment. American citizens have a record number of credit card debt. Go look at your GOP congressman's social media account and see if he's even mentioned it. And let's talk about the why, really, because that's the most important thing. It's not just that you have a maxed out American Express card. Why do you have a maxed out American Express card? Well, here's why. And go check if your GOP congressman addresses this regularly. The American people are in the very beginning of having their way of life disintegrate on them. You are in the very beginning of this. I'm in the beginning of this. People ask me all the time about debt and inflation and, and they'll ask in this way. And, they, and they, I understand what they're saying. They're saying, hey, Jesse, what? What does that mean? We're going we're gonna to have a crisis. What's it going to look like when the debt crisis gets here? Jesse, what's it going to be like? When's it going to be? I get that all the time. What's it going to be like? When's it going to be? Well, um, congratulations, you're in it. 
This is what it looks like. A debt crisis, whenever you talk about a financial crisis for a nation, what Americans will typically think about, myself included, we think about things like the stock market crash. You know, that's what kicked off the Great Depression, where everyone woke up one day and you picked up the New York Times and, oh my gosh, we lost everything, and then the country was wiped out. We think of a debt crisis as if it's an event, but it is not an event. Like most things, it's a process, and you're in the beginning of it right now. Grocery prices are up 40%. That's the bad news. Here's the worst news, and I'm not trying to bring you down. We're just talking about where we are. They're not going back down. This is, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this term that I'm about to use because it got, it got to be a term they used during COVID. So I hate this term, but I'm going to just say it anyway because it's so appropriate. The grocery prices you see now are the new normal. I feel dirty even saying that word, but they are. These energy prices, they're the new normal. This housing market. It's the new normal. Now, housing markets come and go. I mean, we may have some relief there, but when it comes to inflation and debt, this is what it looks like when a nation spends far more than it takes in for long enough. You print enough money, you keep spending more than we have. Well, there's a consequence to that. The reason you're standing in the grocery store with a maxed out credit card, putting the burger back because you can't afford it this week, is because of government spending and printing of money. That's a fact. And you know, speaking of the housing market, what's it look like? Jesse, when's it gonna happen? Well, right now, most Americans, normal Americans, can no longer afford a home. The housing market has been so wrecked. We have young people who will live out their lives now differently than their parents did, and not good differently. There's a very good chance, in fact, I shouldn't say there's a good chance, I know for a fact this is happening. Right now, across America, young people are staying with their parents. And not staying with their parents as in a keep the family unit together thing. We're talking, have found a job, maybe a career, maybe even a husband or a wife, and still living in dad's basement because houses are now unaffordable for young families in the country. Jesse, when's it gonna get here? What's it look like? You're in it. This is what it looks like. Restaurants going under. Restaurants jacking prices up on people. And this is another thing. This is another thing I see a lot now, and everyone will relate to this. People are complaining about a couple things now. They're complaining about the price of food when they go out to eat, and they're complaining about tipping. So many restaurants now are going to automatic tipping. They're demanding more tipping. And so here's what people don't realize is happening. Everyone is being squeezed because the crisis is here. And everyone thinks someone else is doing it. The restaurant owner, his costs are through the roof. He's sitting there stressed. He's looking at the bills. How do I, how do I make ends meet? What do, I, what do I do about this stuff? So he has no choice. He has to jack prices up. He has to jack prices up, and he has to jack prices up in an environment where he can't find good employees. Sure, you can find two or three illegals to wash dishes, but you can't find outstanding customer service people, waiters, waitresses. Talk to a, a restaurant owner about this. So he's jacking prices up. He knows his service is getting worse. His employees are getting worse. So that's the restaurant owner's side of it. For the waiter, for the waitress, trying to make ends meet. Maybe you're in college trying to pay the bills. Maybe you've had to use it as a fallback job, trying to make ends meet with the family. You need those tips. You gotta have those tips. You need the money. The, the, times are tough for you too. Inflation's tough for you too. So you need those automatic tips because people aren't tipping. Why aren't people tipping? Because they're going through hard times too. Food costs have gone up. I can't go out to Red Lobster, Red Lobster and spend $150, but everyone's being squeezed at all sides. What does the crisis look like? What does the financial crisis look like? This is what it looks like. You're in it. And the worst part, the worst part of this is not that we're in it, not that we're in the beginning stages of it. That, that would be bad. The worst part is really nobody, nobody who's in charge right now seems even slightly interested in fixing it. In fact, most of them, you can't even really get them to admit that there's a problem. It's as if the Titanic ran into the iceberg and she's taken on water 
And the captain and the crew, they all got together and they looked at it. They're like, wow, man, we're taking out a lot of water. Anyway, ah, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Go back to sleep. This ship is awesome. That's what, look, look at Hakeem Jeffries here. But two thirds of voters think the economy was better under President Trump. Well, that's just not the case. And we have to do a better job of laying out the facts that the economy has dramatically improved under the leadership of President Joe Biden. What about California? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, I don't live in California. Maybe you do live in California, but no matter what, you should understand that California is an incredibly big part of this economy that affects everybody. California ports affect everyone. California energy, California everything. California is a big part of this nation. California is drowning in debt, financial crisis on their own. Are they going to fix it? Well, I don't know. Does Gavin Newsom seem interested in fixing it? Can we explain to Californians how we moved from a $100 billion surplus to such a significant deficit in just a matter of a few years? Well, it's, uh, yeah, we can explain it. $349 billion of unprecedented capital gains. What we didn't anticipate is these rain bombs in December, January, February, and March, uh, these atmospheric rivers that led to a federal declaration that led to FEMA and the IRS moving in a direction where we couldn't collect our taxes until I believe November 16th, if there was any indication that climate change uh, has impacts well beyond those that are often promoted, uh, I would consider uh, our financial delays as just another example of why we need to tackle them. Another reason I'm looking forward to um, uh, conversations They're not stopping anything. They're not even slowing down. In fact, as you just heard right there, they plan on ramping up everything that got us into this situation to begin with. And look, Joe Biden is starting, starting to talk about these things. Uh, the cost of buying a home in the United States is double uh, what it was when you look at your monthly costs from before the pandemic. Real income, when you account for inflation, is actually down since you took office. Economic growth last week, far short of expectations. Consumer confidence, maybe no surprise, is near a two-year low. With less than six months to go to Election Day, are you worried that you're running out of time to turn that around? We've already turned around. Look, look at the, the Michigan survey. For 65% of American people think they're in good shape economically. They think the nation's not in good shape, but they're personally in good shape. The polling data has been wrong all along. No president's had the run we've had in terms of creating jobs and bringing down inflation. It was 9% when I came to office. 9%. You know, we'll set aside the 9% lie. It's a lie. They, you already got called out by, by lefty news organizations for that lie. We'll set that aside. Let's talk about the jobs for just a quick moment. This is another thing. People aren't necessarily realizing what's happening. Jesse, when's it going to get here? What's it look like? Well, they're talking about jobs a lot. The jobs numbers aren't that bad. Here's Joe Biden bragging about them. Why should people here believe that you will succeed at creating jobs where Trump failed? He's never succeeded in creating jobs, and I've never failed. I've created over 15 million jobs since I've been president. 15 million in three, three and three quarters years. So where do these jobs numbers come from? You don't feel it. You're stressing. Maybe you've had to take a second job. Gig work. I have so many people who email me now. Jesse, I, now I drive for Uber on the weekend trying to make ends meet. Americans are scrambling. So what's with these jobs numbers? Well, if you dig into them, you break them down, you'll find out that since Joe Biden became president, Americans, American citizens, have had a net loss in jobs, tens of thousands of jobs. If it seems like the jobs market is worse, bad for you, it's because it is. Oh, don't get me wrong, there have been millions of jobs created for foreigners. Almost every job has gone to a foreigner. All net job gains have gone to non-citizens. What does it look like? When's it going to get here? Congratulations, you're in it. This is what it looks like. The slow steady degradation of our way of life. 
And this is why we chose to talk about it tonight. It's why we talk about it so often. It is the big deal that is shrinking this nation, crushing the people of this nation. Now, I don't want to distract your congressman from the anti-Semitism on Columbia's campus, but maybe, maybe we keep the big issues the big issues. No? All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I am right. We have the great Josh Hammer joining us next. All kinds of lawfare issues we need updated on, and he will do that as he always does. Before we get to Josh Hammer, let's talk about coffee. Well, patriotism and coffee. We have to put our money where our morals are. You do and I do. And I admit that I fail on this many times. I try not to. I try to be better about where I spend money, where I don't spend money. No, no, that's a bad company. Not Pride Month, I'm out on that. Oh, that's a, I try to be better, and I am better than I have ever been. One of the easiest ways we can do that is coffee, man. It's, it's time to stop waiting in line at that drive through for your coffee. Get Blackout Coffee delivered to you. The company that loves this country, loves God and life in America, they brag about it. They also have the best coffee I've ever tasted in my life and they offer 20% off your first order. 20% off. Blackoutcoffee.com slash Jesse. 20% off your first order. We'll be back. You know, I have a confession to make before I bring in my buddy Josh Hammer. Bob Menendez, Shouldn't even admit this. He makes me laugh, and I kind of like him. And let, let, me exp- let me explain why. He's the ultimate New Jersey politician. They're all like this. Like, half the New Jersey politicians are still in state prison to this day. Why is anyone even surprised? Bob Menendez got busted years ago running underage hookers down in the Dominican. Do you remember that whole thing? And he somehow got out of that scot-free. And then, recently, Bob- <laughs> That's just the most New Jersey thing in the world. Bob Menendez gets caught with gold bars under his bed. He's got suit jackets in his closet, stuffed full of envelopes of cash. (laughs) It's just the most New Jersey thing ever, and he's still part of the Senate. He does appear to be in a bit of trouble for this, though, because looks like he's going to go to prison like everyone else. Well, maybe. I don't know. Let's ask Josh about it. Joining me now, my buddy Josh Hammer, host of America on Trial with Josh Hammer. Josh, what's going on with Slippery Bob? (laughs) <laughs> you know, Jesse, I, I, I want to return to this, but I want to start off on, on a related topic that I will relate to Bob Menendez. I'm not sure if you've ever been to this really fun sports bar in Key West, Florida called Irish Kevin's, but Irish Kevin's is one of the most fun sports bars that I've probably ever been to. And you walk into this bar and they have a lot of people who go on stage and they have games on stage. And the host there, who is Irish Kevin, he's from Ireland, says, what state are you from? And if the answer is 49 of the 50 states, Mr. Irish Kevin says, welcome. If you say you're from New Jersey, that he says F you, except he actually says F you. It's literally the only state that gets that treatment. And that is New Jersey. I mean, this is Bob Menendez. This is the home of Tony Soprano. I mean, that is the state of New Jersey. I mean, I mean, this is a classic New Jersey case. Now, the actual trial here, turning to the actual legal drama, the, the, it's actually happening across the river in New York City. So it's going to be in Manhattan. It is, it is under the under the supervision of the, of the SDNY, the federal prosecutor's office there. If I were a betting man, I, I think it's probably more likely than not that Bob Menendez is going to head to the slammer, at least for some time. He might take a plea deal. Who knows what a plea deal might look like here? But he appears to be caught ridiculously red-handed here, Jesse. I guess not red-handed, maybe gold-handed would be the more accurate term, given the, the, the ample gold bars from the Egyptian government that they found in his closet. Look, the guy is cer- the, the guy is certainly not lacking in chutzpah. I, I mean, the fact that he is still in Congress is utterly insane. I, I mean, who who is found with like a Mercedes Benz convertible from a foreign <laughs> government and gold bars is just like, OK, I'm going to stay in Congress. I mean, like the, the whole thing, it, it, it's really out of like a late night parody skit or something here. But I, I mean, he seems to me to be caught red handed from what I can tell. He does. Okay, why is he still in the Senate, Josh? Has it just come down to basic Democrat politics? Unlike Republicans, they would never shoot their own foot. Is that what it comes down to? 
Well, you know, the interesting thing is, Jesse, he's not ruling out running as an independent. So he basically has said, I'm not going to run for the Democratic Party line. So they had a competitive primary. But he, he is still holding out the possibility of actually running as a third party bid, which should help Republicans, obviously. I mean, Republicans have a, a long and storied and frankly inglorious history of, of never missing an opportunity to miss an opportunity. So they'll probably figure out a way to lose it anyway, even if he does run. But he actually still might run. And, you know, you kind of throw that into the mix. Trump had that rally in New Jersey Saturday evening. Some people are kind of saying maybe there's a world in which New Jersey might sort of be in play for Republicans this fall. Recall that Phil Murphy, the governor of New Jersey in 2021, he actually won his gubernatorial race by about 3%. It was like 51 to 48. So, I mean, it's probably wishful thinking. It's probably fool's gold. But I guess it's it's not out of the realm of some possibility. Okay, let's... Let's move on to a different Democrat who's being attacked by the Biden administration. Henry Cuellar, I believe is how you say that. I don't know, my Spanglish is not all that up to date. What did he do and is he in trouble? Yeah, so a similar story here appears to be direct bribery, or at least that's the allegation. And, you know, there's not literal gold bars in the closet, but based on the evidence that I have seen, I, I mean, the prosecutors have a real case. I mean, recall, Jesse, here, we're dealing with foreign crimes these are against Democratic elected sitting officials being brought by a Democratic Department of Justice overseen by Merrick Garland, who is about as partisan a Democrat as it gets. So just in order to get an indictment in that situation is a pretty big deal because prosecutors obviously have prosecutorial discretion. They don't have to actually bring every possible crime that floats across their radar. Now, it appears here that the Azerbaijani government, I guess the Azeri government is the technical term for it, $600,000 in money that was transferred in, in exchange for fairly direct votes. Azerbaijan's a very wealthy country. They they have a very strong lobbying presence in, in Washington, D.C. It's a very complicated place. I actually was in Armenia on a trip last June. Armenia and Azerbaijan are kind of arch rivals. It, it's a very terrible war that they've been on and off in for roughly 30 years now. So it's not good. And I can tell you, again, the fact that, that he has been indicted in the first place is a very bad look. But I'm sure that he has no signs of, of resigning, of re resigning, excuse me, anytime soon, similar to Bob Menendez, because Jesse, as you and I know, you know, there's one rule of ethics for Republicans and there's an entirely different rule for Democrats. Asher Bajan. Okay, let's, you know, we're going to shift gears, Josh, because we have so much to get to. Stormy Daniels testified in the Trump trial last week. Michael Cohen testified today. What's going on with this Trump trial in New York? So it's funny because the prosecution has teased Michael Cohen as their star witness for for essentially over a year. I mean, really, ever since Alvin Bragg first dropped this indictment over a year ago now in late March, early April of 2023. I mean, it's probably worth reviewing just briefly who Michael Cohen is. Michael Cohen is a convicted felon, someone who has admitted to lying repeatedly as recently as 2018 2019 in, in interviews with the new york times he said oh the trump organization donald trump himself he didn't they didn't reimburse me for the so-called hush money payments i did it myself now he's apparently doing a 180 degree turn again this guy has literally been convicted of a felony for committing perjury and lying to congress lying to federal investigators and this is their so-called star witness in this case but just to make a, a an actual black letter legal point here even if everything that Michael Cohen now is saying is true and that he was lying five or six years ago, even if all of that is true, this case still doesn't hold up because in order to actually prove a federal campaign finance violation under federal election law, you have to prove that the money in question was solely, exclusively and unambiguously for the purpose of helping that candidates get across the finish line. But you have to basically prove beyond a reasonable doubt that's a criminal threshold that there was no other possible motive in the world. So put another way, if Trump's lawyers can show that he cared at all about protecting his son, Barron, Barron Trump from the embarrassment of this whole story, if the, Trump's lawyers can show that Trump himself cared at all about protecting his marriage and shielding Melania, if they can show any of that, then the prosecution's case failed. So I don't think that this is going to go anywhere. Again, it's good for headlines. It's good for Alvin Bragg's political career. This is how you advance up the Democratic Party ladder in New York State. You bring these ridiculous charges. But legally speaking, it's completely meritless. And all Trump needs is one juror to go wobbly. And then he's off the, he's off the hook at that point. Okay, where's he going to find that juror in lower Manhattan? 
So, uh, admittedly, I, I think it's basically a coin flip. I think at this point, it's close to a coin flip as to whether as to whether he's convicted or acquitted. Here, you only need one. Now, here is what I say: if you go back and you look at the at the bios, the biographies of the twelve jurors, I recall there being one juror who dabbled in Truth Social, said that she got some news from Truth Social, was on the New York Post op-ed page. Sometimes you might find it there. Alternatively, what I have said, and admittedly, I don't fully believe this, but it's at least some cause for optimism. Two of the 12 jurors are, are lawyers. One's a corporate lawyer, one's a civil litigator. Now, again, they're lawyers in New York City. So if that's your only variable, if that's your only data point, then you assume without other data that they're probably liberal. However, Jesse, this case is so glaringly flawed from a black letter legal perspective. There are statute of limitation issues. There's a structural reason why it's flawed insofar as Alvin Bragg is a local district attorney ultimately bring federal charges. Dubious at best whether he even has that ability to do that in the first place. So it's flawed for so many reasons that any lawyer who went to law school back in that first year when you learned law should be asking some glaring questions. So what I've been saying on America on Trial, my daily podcast with the first, is that for a juror who is a lawyer, they might be asking some very basic questions to the prosecution. And all you need is one of them to go wobbly and then Trump gets off. All right, let's switch gears again to Hunter Biden. Got some news last week about the federal charges he's facing. Is Hunter Biden going to the clink? So too early to say, but what I can tell you is that I can I can be even more definitive than, than Bob Menendez and say that Hunter Biden is beyond guilty based on the evidence that I have seen and based on the statutes that he has been charged with here. I mean, how do I know that Hunter Biden is guilty of purchasing and transporting in interstate commerce a firearm while being an unlawful user of narcotics? How do I know that, Jesse? Because Hunter Biden told the world that. He literally put that in his memoir. I mean, I don't know who the heck thought that was a good idea, whether it was an editor or a publicist or an agent. He probably should have had a lawyer telling him you probably shouldn't do this. But I mean, the evidence is right there for everyone to see. They found the the, the revolver, the the, the, the the pistol last year. I think it had some cocaine residue on it, if memory serves. I think he's dead to rights, honestly. Now, again, this is going to be a test for our justice system. Is Hunter Biden actually going to face a clear trial? That I don't know the answer to. I really don't. I, I'm hardened by the fact that, that the special counsel, David Weiss, was ultimately able to bring these charges in the first place. I'm hardened by the fact that Merrick Garland ultimately did not tell him to, to shush, shush, go away, don't bring anything. But you never know. I mean, there might be some surreptitious, sneaky, sneaky stuff going on behind the scenes here. But based on the actual conduct and the statutes, he really does appear to have violated the statutes. <laughs> oh, Hunter Biden, what a gem he is. America on Trial with Josh Hammer. Go download it every day. Josh, my brother, thank you, as always. All right. We have culture war stuff next. I seem a little pepped up again today. You know why I'm so pepped up? It's because I keep sleeping for like nine, ten hours a night. Solid. Not getting up. I don't even wake up to roll over. Why? Well, have you heard of dream powder? This stuff's amazing. Beam is the name of the company. And you know, they have, there's all kinds of things out there to sleep. You know, you take this to sleep, take that to sleep. And every one of them that I've ever taken, I wake up and I'm half dead. And I'm half dead the rest of the day. I don't feel refreshed. I don't feel good. Beam's got all this natural. It's just all natural. Magnesium, things like that. Pour it in a little thing of milk. Warm it up. It's a cinnamon hot chocolate, essentially, that I sip on before bed. And you just kind of drift off to the best sleep ever. But you don't wake up feeling half dead and groggy, one eye closed, you wake up ready to go. You want sleep like that? Go to shopbeam.com slash Jesse Kelly and get yourself some dream powder. 40% off. Shopbeam.com slash Jesse Kelly. We'll be back. Well, these culture war battles end up in the courts most of the time, and a lot of the big ones that are out there right now, they're getting to the big boy court all the way to the Supreme Court. And I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know anything about all this legal stuff, so we have to talk to Sarah about it because she's going to get us educated. Joining me now, Sarah Partial Perry, Senior Legal Fellow at the Great Heritage Foundation, of course, former Senior Counsel, U.S. Department of Education. Okay, Sarah, what's going to, to the Supreme Court, and what do we think about it? 
Well, we've actually got seven cases right now, seven federal cases and an eighth about to be filed that are challenging the Biden administration's vast rewrite of a 52-year-old civil rights law that protects equality in education between the sexes, Title IX. Now, everyone thinks of Title IX as being the college sports rule, but in fact, sports weren't added to Title IX's uh, provisions until later, three years after its adoption. But what we've seen is essentially a blowback, a revolt in largely Republican-led states of really epic proportions. I think this administration has overestimated that expanding the definition of sex, which has always been understood in federal law to mean male and female, to include gender identity, naturally puts transgender identified males up against biological females, not only in bathrooms, locker rooms, dorm rooms, and housing accommodations, but perhaps most critically in sports. And the Biden administration has told America that sports are not included in this rule, but the plain text of the rule mentioning athletics and extracurricular activities indicates distinctly otherwise. So we know that sports are, for all intents and purposes, on the chopping block as well. Okay, Sarah, given the makeup of the Supreme Court, this seems like it's one that would obviously go our way to an untrained eye like myself, but you have the trained eye. Are we worried about how they're going to rule on this? I'm really not, and here's why. I think regardless of whether or not we look distinctly at the term sex, and of course we have one of the justices, uh, Ketanji Jackson Brown, who herself said she didn't know in her Senate confirmation testimony whether or not she could identify what a woman was because she was, quote, not a doctor, which I find a little bit fallacious. But nevertheless, what this particular Supreme Court has been concerned with is an overreach on the part of the executive administration. Remember that the Biden administration has already had its ears pinned back on quite a number of decisions in which it's taken purported federal authority under one statute and expanded it to be able to shoehorn through its own particular pet policy agendas. For example, I give you West Virginia versus EPA, in which the Supreme Court said you cannot use the Clean Air Act to force millions of dollars in carbon emissions caps on top of every corporation in America. They struck down the CDC's eviction moratorium during the COVID pandemic. They did the same for the national OSHA vaccine mandate. So this is a particular Supreme Court that does not like it when the federal government takes more power to itself than the underlying statute permits. And to redefine the definition of sex in a 52-year-old federal civil rights statute that, by the way, was amended twice, at which point they could have expanded the definition of sex to include gender identity, but to skirt the boundaries of congressional amendment and basically take from thin air a definition of sex that's never been supported in a reading of this statute is really beyond the pale and something I believe these particular justices are going to be very concerned with. Sarah, on, on a macro level, I remember we used to talk about Obama doing this exact same thing. He would just assert all this executive authority, orders here, orders there, orders there. And then the courts would, of course, shoot down 90% of his stuff, but not 100% of his stuff. So in the end, the ball does move left. Are we seeing the same thing with Biden? No, and I'll tell you why, because Biden has followed the procedural letter of the law by following something called the Administrative Procedure Act. In other words, they've gone through a process called rulemaking, and that is a process by which any executive agency in the federal government makes a new interpretation of one of its purportedly ambiguous provisions in federal law. And of course, in this particular instance, under the definition of sex, as it has always been understood in federal civil rights law, they've gone through the process of soliciting comments from the public. And in fact, were inundated with nearly 240,000 public comments, which is more than any other federal rulemaking has ever received in the history of agency rulemaking. So they've gone through the motions of actually 
actually making this particular interpretation look like it passes legal muster by making sure they went through notice and comment, making sure that they issued 1,500 pages of regulatory explanation. But regardless, in the end, this Supreme Court is going to be, I believe, distinctly skeptical of these particularly aggressive approaches. Sarah, you mentioned earlier, to wrap this up here, you mentioned the red states have been particularly aggressive with this administration. Are you seeing this ramp up as just kind of a general rule for the red states? What I'm essentially asking, Sarah, and hoping, to be honest with you, are red states starting to join together and push back harder and more than they ever have against all the craziness? Yeah, a hundred percent, and particularly as concerns this particular rulemaking. We know that these state superintendents of schools and the state governors and even the local uh, education associations have really had enough of the sexual politics that's been coming down from the Department of Education. We're seeing essentially the queering of American classrooms, and it's orchestrated at the top levels by this Department of Education. Remember, we have federal agencies in other offices offices who are telling us that gender, quote, affirming care is life-saving, says the man in the dress who's in the number two slot at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. We've seen the exact same thing from Miguel Cardona, Secretary of Education, coming down from the Department of Education. This is the way that they shoehorn a hard left sexual politic through the entire body of American education. And so I think what we're seeing now is the exhibition of character and courage on a lot of the governor's parts and a lot of these state superintendents of school parts. We've already seen Oklahoma, Texas, and Florida to come out. All of their governors say we will not abide by this federal law. We've seen no fewer than 17 superintendents of schools band together and submit letters to the Department of Education saying we are not going to comply with this. Whether or not you hold our federal funding hostage doesn't matter as long as we have the opportunity to protect girls and women in education. And that is, I think, not only gratifying, I'm hoping it's the kind of courage that is contagious and we see See more of that in the future. Yeah, fingers crossed for that. Sarah, that was outstanding. Please come back and join us anytime. Thank you so much. I feel so much smarter now. Before we go, we have other things to do. We have to get involved in a primary. The general election you skip or you participate in, I'm sorry, is less important than the primary you skipped. Primaries matter more than general elections. We're going to get involved in one next. Before we do that, we're going to get involved in your timeshare. No, I don't want to stay at your timeshare. Thank you. I appreciate it. But I just want you to get out of it. I know you want out. Everyone's trying to cut costs right now, especially because the annual fees have doubled. Special assessments, you can't even get in the stupid thing anymore. And everyone wants out of them. Well, Lone Star Transfer will get you out. The timeshare company is not going to let you out. They'll lie. They'll tell you you're in it for life. But Lone Star Transfer is the family business. The family business with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau that gets people legally and permanently out 99% of the time. Sound good? Call them. Just call them. 844-310-2646. They're wonderful people. They'll get you out. All right? We'll be back. The general election you attend, you vote in, is less important than the primary you skip. 25% Republican participation in primaries nationally is an embarrassment and a disgrace. And until that number changes, we will not save the United States of America. So, Jesse, what do I do? Well, here's one you can get involved in. Bacon out of Nebraska. He is a Republican congressman, one of the biggest turds in Congress, routinely screws over you and your values, and there's a solid human being running against him. You want to hear from this guy? Dan Fry joins us now, running against the famous, infamous Don Bacon. You know his name if you watch this show. All right, Dan, why are you running against that piece of trash? Well, Jesse, I don't know what else I can add to that. You, uh, you summed it up pretty well right there. Um, and I could not agree more that the primary that you skip is far more important than the general election that you'll ever vote in. The primary is where we start to take out this garbage. It, it's where we start to get things 
to where we've actually got some alternatives that are going to make a difference uh, in D.C. And if we don't fix it at the primary, then you might as well just accept the fact that you're going to get two, two more years or six more years of the same junk that uh, we've been getting for, for decades now. Dan, why do people like Don get elected in places like Nebraska? And I'm not pointing any fingers at Nebraska. My state of Texas is famous for this. South Carolina, the Dakotas, these red states, these meat and potato states, America type states, they pick the biggest losers to send to Congress in the Senate. And I don't understand it. How did this guy weasel his way through the Nebraska primary and into the Congress? Well, what you have to understand is that when Congressman Bacon first got to Nebraska. He ran as an individual that was going to go and he was going to cut spending, he was going to cut the debt, the deficit, he was going to get the border under control. All of all of those things were a part of his platform. Um, he's delivered on zip, none of it. But the problem that we've got is that once they're elected, they become entrenched. They have the money necessary to control the narrative. So it's hard to get rid of them once you realized what you've put into office. So again, when, when that happens, it becomes even more imperative that you've got to get involved in this, uh, in this primary election. You've got to listen to what's actually taking place. But they end up with a war chest going into a primary once they're elected, and that's hard to overcome. That's hard to beat. Why are you running? What got you all fired up and into this thing? Well, here's, here's the reality of, of what's gotten us to where we're at today. I did this 10 years ago, back when the Tea Party was, was alive and well. And we had a very similar congressman at the time. And uh, his name was Lee Terry. And Lee Terry had been there for eight terms, 16 years. And the people of Nebraska were just tired. They were tired of Lee taking his marching orders from what was, at that point in time, John Boehner. And Lee, Lee stopped listening to his constituents. We were still feeling the after effects of bailing out the auto industry. We were still feeling the after effects of, of bailing out the banks. Uh, the government had just taken over the healthcare industry and it was uncertain, it was unclear as to what kind of healthcare were we gonna have? Were we gonna repeal this? Were we gonna replace Obamacare? What was happening with it? And Jesse, at the time, we had tens of thousands of people a year crossing our border and nobody was doing anything about it. They were crossing the border illegally and we were $17 trillion in debt. I had two grandchildren and one on the way at the time. And at that point in time, I looked at this and said, this isn't sustainable. We can't continue down this path. So I ran for office. And what was interesting is, is we had a very similar situation to what we've got right now. We were outspent 20 to one. We fell 2.9% short of flipping the vote because once we got to the constituents, once we got to the voters, they were, they were upset. They, 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 were, they were ready for a change. And um, we again, th that race right there, there was only one other race in that election cycle that was any closer. You may remember it. It was when uh, Dave Bratt beat Eric Cantor, the, uh, the sitting uh, speaker for the Republicans. It was a great night. We, and again, being outspent 20 to one, we fell 2.9% short. So it can be done. You've got to get out there and you've got, you've got to get going. So, so when you ask what made me get involved in this race, if you look at what motivated me 10 years ago and where we're at today, every one of those metrics are, are far worse today than, than they were 10 years ago. And at that time I had two grandchildren and one on the way, I've now got 10. So I think it's worthy of sounding the alarm that says, folks, we're headed for a fiscal cliff like we've never seen before. If, if we don't fix it soon, it's not gonna be recoverable. We've got a full blown border invasion on our Southern border. And no one's doing anything about it. And I'm tired of listening to the Republican Party say you need a new president. We need we need to get a new president. No, you don't. Take the constitutional authority and powers that you've got in the in the power of the purse and fix this mess. If you've got a if you've got a uh, president that doesn't want to cooperate with you, you have control of the purse. You control what happens. It was it was Justice uh, Scalia that it said the House is the most powerful branch of the government because they control the purse strings. So if you don't like what's happening, stop funding it. But we don't have anybody in the house, at least not from Nebraska, that's got the courage to lead. So it's time that we send individuals to DC that will actually do something rather than to talk about it. Dan, so what's your website so people can go support you? What's your website? It's Fry, 
the number four, Nebraska.com. It's F R E I, the number four, Nebraska.com. Here's where we're at. We love where we're at right now. We've got a ground game that is second to none. I've never seen so many volunteers in a campaign. We're touching tens of thousands of doors in this campaign. We're going to be outspent, but we're not going to be outworked. We like where we're at. We believe that Don Bacon has served his last term in office. So, you know, we're, we're, we're feeling pretty good about where we're at. I love this freaking guy. Fryfornebraska.com. Election is tomorrow. Dan, I will be watching the results roll in with bated breath. Probably not as nervous as you and your family. Fingers crossed prayers for you and yours, my friend. Go get them. Go freaking get them. That's what I'm talking about. Get involved. Lighten the mood. Next. All right. It's time to lighten the mood, and nothing lightens my mood than some good old-fashioned defiance of ridiculous government rules. So, guy in California gets a boat. These dirty commies don't let him. He's not allowed to park his boat in the driveway. They tell him he's got to have it fenced in. He's got to fence in his boat. <laughs> so, in one of the all-time spite moves, I just love this. The dude, he puts his boat in his driveway, and he puts up a fence like he's required to do. And as you see right there, <laughs> he just paints it. Well, look, the picture shows you. You go, buddy. Live free or die. All right. I'll see you tomorrow.